world's changing, as we've talked about, and one of those big changes in the world is technology. Um, technology's everywhere. We all have smartphones. We all interact with technology every single day of the week. Construction, the dirt world, it's a little slower to adapt, but it is adapting nonetheless. Every job site I go on to these days has some form of technology, whether it be GPS or software, telematics, whatever it may be. So we just wanted to touch high level on technology, how it's changing businesses. We have Mr. Randy Blunt of Blunt, Mr. Dan Briscoe of BuildWit. For those of you that don't know, Dan was at the software company, HCSS, before this. So he's well versed in the world of construction technology. Randy, high level, how important is technology in your guys' business? I mean, on so many aspects, it's, it's integral. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, the accounting software. We've talked about you need to know your job costing. Mm -hmm. The only real effective way to do that is by implementing software and some technology. Um, knowing where your equipment's at. You know, how do you manage your equipment if you don't know where it's at? Telematics are an important part. Yeah, sure, you could drive around and find every piece of equipment, but it would cost you a lot of money to do that and take a lot of time and it wouldn't be as accurate. Um, GPS, like, I, I think we all know that there's plenty of good operators who can finish, but even the good and the great operators will tell you it's easier with GPS. Mm -hmm. You know, like, there's times where it doesn't work or doesn't work well, but ultimately you're more productive with them. And if there's something out there that helps you be more productive, you have to adopt it. Like there's not even, there's no option. If you don't, sooner or later, you won't be able to compete. Um, so I think kind of on, on just every level, what I've seen is you don't have to be first, you don't have to be the early adopter, mm -hmm. but you have to recognize adoption is a necessity. And if you want to survive, technology is going to be in your business. And adoption is one thing, but actually putting it to use is a whole other. I know you probably saw this a lot. It's yeah. all right. We'll we'll get the software. That's great. But if you don't actually use it, it's not doing anyone any good. Or use ten percent of its capabilities. Yeah. yeah. And I think on like HCSS, for example, or build. You know, B two W build to win, bid to win. It's easy to not implement it all. And why? It's because it takes work. Like, you know, implementation, you have an implementation specialist come out, he spends two days with you and... Right. But that's not implementing it. Right. Right, it's gonna take weeks, months for everybody to get comfortable with software and, and to really be diving into what it does. And then you need to stay up on it. I mean, all of these, all of these software companies are releasing uh, additional capabilities. You have to stay in touch with that and get trained up on it. So. Uh, you know, adoption isn't just implementing it, it's truly adopting its capabilities within your company, which takes work. At what level, and I know when you took over, you know, Blunt, it was a certain size, and then you, you did everything with spreadsheets, and you were really good. I know you were good at spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. I've seen some of them. At what level did you think, hey, I need to start going to that next level. Like I've outgrown my you know, accounting system, I've outgrown spreadsheets. What, what, what size, what advice do, would you give? to? When should people start looking at that? So almost right away. So I took over about four million, was when my father got sick. Within like a, the first year, we said, hey, we need better accounting software. Now, I couldn't tell you what QuickBooks does today because maybe it's better at this. But when we were using it, QuickBooks didn't allow you to job cost well. It didn't allow you to allocate cost to a job and a phase code to figure out how am I doing in that definable scope. So uh, right away we said, hey, we need an additional software. Um, for us, we went to Foundation. So it's a, it's a construction related software, it's good software. Um, but we even outgrew what we felt like, we even outgrew that software and we, right. we, we moved again after, after that. So um, I'd say job costing is so important that unless QuickBooks has added the capability to really job cost, you outgrow that software quite quickly. So you need, and you need to do that well right from the beginning, yeah. whatever size you are. You, you have to do that well. You have to understand your costs. 
yeah, I mean, if you don't understand your cost, in my opinion, it's a recipe for disaster. If it's just you and a few guys, you probably can get by because in your head, you probably have a decent understanding and can really control it. But once you're relying on other people to help manage the business, they need to be empowered in knowing the cost. So I, I think it's, it's very early in a business that you need to build a job cost. And just implement technology in general. I see a lot of smaller contractors and they say, well, I just can't, I can't afford that right now. And I look at it from the other way. I'm like, I don't think you can afford not to do that. And even using basic telematics, for example, like what's cost isn't all that great, if anything, but even understanding fuel burn of one machine. If you just have a skid steer, that could change the way how you operate. Or, hey, maybe I don't need to be idling this machine as much as I am right now. That can save you just a little bit at first, but over time, that's a dramatic savings for even a small contractor. Or I've seen a lot of small contractors implementing GPS. Pre previously, it was like, this is the stupidest thing ever. This is only, this is only for blunt. This is only for, for the big contractors. Now they're starting to implement it. I'm like, I can't believe I didn't have this. I've been screwing up by not taking advantage of this. Yeah. So a few things like on telematics is interesting. Um, you know, we implemented telematics around probably that, that $14 million mark. When we were in the process of finding out systems, we were like, hey, we need to figure this out. Since then, Telmax have gotten better. Mm -hmm. um, uh, currently, the, the, you know, we work with Trimble on our telematics just because of where we have a cat fleet and integration's really good. But there's other systems that are out there that are good. We use like Sam Sarah on our vehicles. One of the things that um, is impressive is Telemax tell you a lot now. Like, for example, I can tell you when somebody doesn't have their seatbelt on. And that's important because I know a lot of times in this industry, people think it's not that big of a deal. I've met plenty of people who are like, I'm in an excavator, what is a seatbelt gonna do? Well, because of um, my exposure to the industry at the executive level, I can tell you the horror stories. And so we can identify what day it was run that we had these errors, and was it, cons was it, was it, was it just once or did it happen multiple times? And then we can use our job, our, our um, uh, heavy job, you know, the iPad uh, that the foreman used to do time, and we can say who was on that job in that piece of equipment on that day. And we can say, now we need to go train, right? Even if you're a good owner and you're out on the jobs all the time because the business is small and you're like, I got a handle on this. Do you know if your guy's not wearing a seatbelt? Probably not, right? So there's, there's ways that technology helps us that I didn't even, I hadn't even thought about. When we did, got Telemax, I never thought in my, my head, I'm gonna help our guys be safer because I'm gonna know they're not wearing their seatbelts. But since we adopted it, not implemented it, but we adopted it, we're using it to its fullest, we can now say, hey, there's these things that we hadn't thought of on the peripheral that we're actually better at because of it. Mm -hmm. Now let's just run through basically what the big technologies at your company are specifically. So we have telematics, we have GPS, we have modeling, probably takeoff software, mm -hmm. estimating software, accounting software, yep. time, tracking time, yep. submitting photos, yep. and, and uh, progress and equipment damage and inspecting equipment. Yep. Safety. Yeah. Safety. Yep. Safety. What, what else do you guys have? Uh, you didn't talk about drones. We use drones. Drones. For quantity, for quantity survey. Yeah. Survey yeah. equipment. Yep. Survey equipment. Yeah. Yeah. And all of them have their place. Is it harder to implement some of those technologies when you're smaller? Yeah, it is. But, but the barrier of entry has come down significantly. Yeah. Our first drone was $45,000. You can get a uh, Phantom RTK, or um, you can get a DJI RTK drone for about $7,500. Mm -hmm. um, so it's able to take pictures and do survey. It can pay for itself really quickly. Like I can't tell you how many times, we use, we use that partnered with Propeller, which is a, a, a software that actually processes the data for you and hosts it in the cloud. We use those two together on a regular basis, and um, it's just a great pr like prevention tool for leaving a job uh, not complete. Like before we leave it, we fly it, we know it's done. Like you took pictures of that Camelback um, uh, basement. We know, we know where we're at. We're comparing our data with the as-built of the surveyor. There's no surprises. If there is a surprise, we're able to say like, well, hold on, how come our data is not matching the as-built 
and then have a conversation, figure it out before the equipment leaves. Like, think about it. All the equipment leaves. A week later, it all has to come back. Mm -hmm. That costs you a lot of money. Probably paid for the drone just once. Yeah. Just that happening once. And then on top of that, um, you know, in our market, you, we don't always do the utilities. Um, I know in other markets that's not the case, but still, there's a lot of other people there that are messing up grade. We leave the site, we have a picture of what the site looks like, and we have a, a topography map of what it looks like. Before we come back, we do the same thing, and we go, hey, look, here's all the stuff that was messed up. Usually in our contract, we're not responsible for regrading what they mess up, and we just say, hey, we're not sure who did this. Um, we're glad to fix it, but we just want you guys to have this data so that you can go get payment from whoever you need to get it from, and, and we'll, we'll take care of it. Um, if you don't do that, you're doing work for free. So, uh, you know, drone implementation used to be a pretty high barrier of entry, not as high now. GPS, I used to think um, that's for the big guys, you know? And then I started doing the math. And I was like, okay, so in our organization, grade checkers, you know, it's changed over the years, but for the most part, um, you know, they're making north of $20 an hour. Uh, they can, they're, you know, most of them make it into the mid $20 an hour range. Um, so probably, probably most of them are averaging around $25 an hour is my guess for a real grade checker. You start doing the math, you're like, okay, that guy's making about $1,000 a week. That's $52,000 a year. That's a system. Mm -hmm. That's about what mm -hmm. a system costs for a dozer or a motor grader. And it works every day, no matter what, really for years upon years. Yeah. Um, doesn't mess up. And so you're like, huh, well, maybe it doesn't cost that much. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, then the operator is more efficient too. Well, and you're not necessarily, and I know people will push against technology in the field because they'll be like, well, I don't want to lose my job. Yeah. So you're replacing me, oh, what the hell? No. But you're not replacing that grade checker, no. grade setter, whatever people refer to them as. You're, you're, that person's going elsewhere within the organization. The, the, the system creates efficiency and does a lot for you, yeah. but you still need people that know how to fix it, mm -hmm. know how to set it up, know how to leverage it. Like, just because a machine has machine controls doesn't mean you, you, you never will need grade stakes on the ground. It's rare that you go on a job site and every machine has it all. Usually there's a, there's a handful of machines that have it, mm -hmm. but there's still a need for some stakes on the ground. Most often it makes the grade checker's life easier, yeah. right? Because they're not pounding stakes all day, every day. Um, in, in our market, if years ago, if you were doing that, you were the grade checker, but you had a laborer with you because you were pounding so many stakes that somebody was riding on each stake, you know, putting the ribbons on it, someone else was pounding the hub, and then pounding the stake in. I've been there. Yeah. It's a fun day. <laughs> yeah. So now that job most often can be done by one person. Mm -hmm. But we talked about, we have a labor shortage. We, we need those people. So we freed up one laborer who was pounding stakes, and we just said, let's go use him somewhere else. We didn't say, hey, see you later. Don't need you anymore. <laughs> Because we need people. And what have you seen with contractors? What are the mistakes contractors make when it comes to technology? Yeah, I was, I was going to ask Randy, but I know some of these. I would say some technology, especially on the software side, I don't know as much on hardware, but on software, it's like you get a price tag from a vendor, and let's say it's $20,000, and you're like, okay, this is a $20,000 software. Well, it's not. It's it's. $20,000 plus the implementation and, and training. And that, I would rough rule of thumb, and this is my, it might be any, some smart person's opinion, but I would say double it. You know, it's gonna cost you $20,000 and to fully implement and have the time. Um, sometimes double, triple, depending on, you know, if it's an accounting software, it's gonna take a lot. So take the cost and then don't, the, the big mistake is everybody skimps on that side. Okay, I need this, I'll get it in. I'm super smart, I, I've got a smartphone, I, I know how to you know, do technology. And so they skimp on, on the training and implementation. Uh, and then I've, you know, in, I, I've, I've doubled back and spent more on that training and implementation to fix everything that, you know, CRM systems, all these things, because I didn't do it right up front, so I would say, Take the time up front when you're looking at the costs, 
ask the company what training implementation, implementation where do people make mistakes, what's, what are those costs, and then just know, you know it's double or triple to, to do this well. Yeah. You, you, no, it's like a perfect thought. And this is, this is how contractors think, because I, I, I think this way. I, I try not to, but this is how I do think sometimes. So this guy's gonna be here today. He's gonna be training our staff and he costs us $1,200 for the day, $1,500 for the day, $2,500 for the day. Like, man, you get this guy out of here, he's expensive. Mm -hmm. Or get this girl out of here, she's expensive. But the same time, like for example, estimating software, think about if you can use the software and leverage it to its fullest capabilities or you don't. How easy it is it to make a thousand dollar mistake in an estimate, or a two thousand dollar mistake right. in an estimate? It's like, well, I'm going to bid two hundred projects this year. I can make a thousand dollar mistake in every one of them in in just a few seconds if I didn't. Like, what if I didn't get my fuel input cost right, and I didn't realize it until I'd already got I already won seven projects. Man, we we're killing it. We just we keep winning all these jobs. We know our costs now. Oh crap, we didn't have any fuel in here. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah, just spend a little bit more on it. I, I think even more important than that is, is have a discussion with whoever's implementing software and say, I want you to come, I want you to implement it. Let's, let's spend, what do you recommend? You know, two, three days, let's get it implemented. Come back in two weeks and let's do it again. Yeah. Because what happens is you implement it and everyone knows it and then they, they, the guy leaves or the girl leaves who's helping you implement and then all of a sudden you're like, I don't remember how to do this. Right. And you kind of work your way through it and you figure, you figure out how you're going to do it. But then you just end up having kind of your way and not the best way. Then bring them back um, and, and run through kind of that exercise again and, and it'll really help you to implement your software well. Uh, another best practice I've seen here is com contractors will choose just a few people within the organization mm -hmm. to spend a lot of time yeah. in implementation. So they don't go get everybody out of the field and put them through implementation. They'll create those Know, super users or whatever they're called yeah. to become that teacher within the organization and yeah. like a company like Rosso has done a great job of this is they'll they'll they'll, they'll invest a lot of time and energy into training just a few individuals and then those individuals will be the go-to people for that software within the organization which accelerates adoption because now you don't need to call the software company every time you need something and then it's peer teaching now the other people are learning from up here, not from a software guy. And that's a barrier sometimes in this industry is, well, they're a soft, they're a technology person, they don't they really know what I do. But if you're learning about it from another foreman, from another superintendent, from another person within your business that's wearing the same hard hat as you, mm -hmm. you're a lot more likely to listen. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, software champion, super user, whatever. Yeah. Great. And plus you can also find, select somebody who has that aptitude. Yeah. I mean, most of us who have, you know, several people, there's somebody we, like right away, we can think of, mm -hmm. yeah, that person's probably a little bit better on software. Select that person, let them win, let them show where they're strong, give them some confidence, it's good for that individual. Agreed. The, the other mistake I see is, is, is some companies approach uh, buying a new piece of software equipment with like, a, okay, I've, I've got to get, you're here to sell, oversell me. I'm going to get every last dime. It, there's almost an antagonistic relationship, mm -hmm. and you can do that, and you can beat pe vendors up on price, and and you will get the very basic service that they have. There's other companies that are a much smaller percentage. They take a different approach, and they're like, "Hey, I, I want to partner with you on this. You guys are experts at this. I'm expert at running my company." Let's solve this problem that I have together. I know you're trying to make money on this. Let's let's part. But I need, you know, there's the sale, and then I need to implement, and then there's six months down. Maybe I get really good at 20% of the of using this, but I want to, you know, I want to fully leverage this. I want, I'll be a case study for you. You know, we'll show the before and after. You take, there's some companies that take a whole different approach. They get five, six times the service level of that company that does that basic level. How often do you think those are the people who are complaining about being treated the same way by their clients? Yeah, exactly. It, it's funny. Every yeah. time. We, we had this shift, because we, I'll be honest, we were kind of tough on our vendors years ago. Um, we had this kind of conversation, it was just, 
It was simple. It was like, shouldn't we be treating others as we want to be treated? Like, we don't like working for people that treat us that way. Well, let's start treating the people that work. Like, hey, can we, can we change how all of our clients treat us? No, but we can change how all of our vendors treat us mm -hmm. or how we treat all of our vendors. Yeah. And we started doing it. And you know what's interesting is we, at times, were paying for premium service, yet our profitability margins kept going up. Mm -hmm. And then we started hearing stuff like, how come... How come Blunt always gets what they need? Like, are you guys related or something? Or, you know, just <laughs> stuff like that. No. We just partnered with them and sat down and said, hey, we want to partner. We've decided we win when we're in partnerships, and we think that goes both ways, whether it's with a client or a vendor. Yeah. So how do you help us be better? How do you help us control our costs? What, what can we do? Right. And uh, you're, you're, like, spot on. Yeah. We got treated differently. And, and some people want the easy button. Hey, I just wrote you a $20,000 check. This should just magically work. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't work that way. You, you know, even you know, when you were working with Build Wits, like you've got to put some time and effort if we're going to really have something good here. And so you, you've got to, if you're going to invest in this, put the time and effort into it. Put the extra cost for the training implementation. Don't stop at 20% adoption. Make sure you get you know, the full value of that technology, have a good relationship. Uh, you, it, the difference between those companies that take that approach versus those that just make a purchase, it's not a small gap. It's a, it's a major gap and people don't know it. They, they think, hey, you know, we've, we bought this, we're fully leveraging it. But when you look at it, I'd say 90% of companies are using about half of what they bought the software for. It's interesting. I see that all the time. And if they would just think about what they're trying to do, think about all the effort that goes into a job. And you're trying to implement software that's not for a job, it's for your entire company. You're working on your entire company. It's not gonna be quick and easy. Mm -hmm. Like If you go into software projects thinking, man, that's really cool software, this is gonna be quick and easy and we're gonna be so much better. You're mistaken, you won't implement it, you won't like it, you won't have fun, and it won't make a difference in your business. Go into it like, this software kills it, it's gonna be a lot of work to get it implemented right and to get it integrated, and then find people to assign to the project, just like you would a project, make a schedule, make a plan, and go do it. Right. Like, just the, oh, here's two guys, they're here, and, and hey, I'm, we're, we've been guilty of this. We right. did, we've learned this the hard way, we've, we've done just that. Oh, we're, we're all young, we're good at software, we'll figure it out. We've implemented software every year, it seems like we're implementing something, we got this. And then here we are, hey, I've never seen that feature before. Right. You know? Well, it goes back to that extreme ownership mentality. Yeah, exactly. Like, implementing that software and taking advantage of that software in your business is your responsibility. Like, sure, you want the software company's help, you're paying good money, but ultimately, it's your responsibility to make sure it's, it's there. And, and a big mistake I see contractors make is they approach it like it's buying a bulldozer or buying materials. It, it's, it's not. It's, they're completely different people. They operate completely differently. It's a different skill set, and it's, it's not the same. Yeah. And just even identifying that, hey, this isn't an equipment dealer, and it's not going to work the same, I think is a huge benefit to the project overall. Yeah, no, for sure. And then technology, technology companies are always improving. And so even though you fully understand it and fully implemented it in February and December, they may have done two more launches. And you've, you've got to stay up to date, go to the conferences, have a good relationship with the sales and support staff. Like that, that you, these things change all the time. So it, it's not just a one and done, oh, I, I implemented this technology. I can just let it go. And remember, like, even though we're all busy when that stuff happens, you gotta find time for it. Mm -hmm. right? If you don't, then you, uh, what, we, we went to Con Expo one year and one of the softwares we were using, and we're like, this, there's this thing that just drives us nuts, bugs the heck out of us. And they're like, well, what, what version are you on? I'm like, I'm not sure. So we look it up, he's like, that's three releases ago. Right. We fixed that. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. dang it. <laughs> but to tie it all back, if you're not managing your business effectively, if you're not trusting and training people, if you're not setting everything up, you're running around with your hair on fire all the time and you don't have time for that. I don't have time to go to a software conference. That's right. ridiculous. Like, that's a waste of my time. But that's the stuff you a lot of times should be doing as a business owner if you've set 
or as a leader in general. I mean, even if you're a PM, you should be able to leave your job every once in a while. You shouldn't need to be there every single day making every decision. If, you're, if you can't get away from your job, that's a red flag. You're not planning well enough. No. And that's what it comes down. I mean, everything we talk about, I keep thinking like, do you have a plan? Yeah. Even Jocko, you, you go back to Jocko when he talks about extreme ownership, he talks about, so here we are, we're doing our brief, here's our plan, here's our contingency, here's, here's our next contingency. We don't do that enough. I mean, software is just, technology is just one example of that. Like, the PM needs to leave the project. Well, is the plan well enough thought out and is there contingencies planned out so he knows, hey, I can go turn my phone off for two days to be in this conference? If he doesn't, he doesn't feel like that's the case, then the PM who's listening to this needs to say, man, that's right, I, need, I do need to improve myself and I need to go to my manager and say, I don't know how to use whatever software well enough. There's this conference. I'm going to show him I planned. They're not just say, hey, can I have off for this? No, I'm going to show him I've planned out my job. I've put together contingencies. I've run through with the superintendent. I need to go to this training because I need to be better at this. That's a great point. And I think, I mean, we could sit here and talk about this for days and we will get into it in more detail yeah, with yeah, some of the best experts out there, which I'm very excited about. But uh, I guess the purpose of this was to just talk about technology from a high level, talk about some of the issues, and I think that's a great spot to leave it. Yeah. So that's brief discussion on technology. We'll have a lot more in detail coming soon.